Hi everyone, welcome. Good evening, good morning, good afternoon. It's so exciting to see people tuning in from so many different places and time zones around the world. Happy Pride Month, everyone. And um, welcome to this Agam Convergence, the second Agam Convergence. I'm Padma Perez. I'm the lead strategist for the Agam Agenda. And the welcome chairs you just saw are the creation of the artist Farah Manuel Nolasco. And the music was a, an old uh, Filipino folk song called Doon Po Sa Amin, or In Our Hometown. And it's played by the renowned uh, guitarist Adric Cristobal uh, for the Agam Agenda. And um, working with me tonight and joining me in welcome you are my, welcoming you are my teammates, Carissa, Julia, Pilar, and Drew. Say hello. We also have some colleagues from the Institute for Climate and Sustainable Cities. So from all of us, happy Pride Month again. This is so important. And welcome to Corals and Willows. If you haven't already, please drop everyone a note in the chat box. Say hello and tell us where you're joining us from. So we are the Agam Agenda. And what we do is we aim to spark climate conversations through stories and art. and. We deeply believe that art speaks the language of the heart, and this is the language through which we can reimagine and create kinder futures for the coming generations, for all our neighbor species, not just for us humans. So this gathering that um, brings us all together today is part of this work. Um, this is a coming together of people, of ideas, of art and science. And I want to emphasize for everyone that this is not a webinar where we're going to sit back and listen to a couple of great lectures. But we'd really like this to be a conversation. So we hope you've come ready to share your thoughts, your stories, your insights, your questions, any reactions you have to what you're hearing. Um, and also to reciprocate what Tom and Yuvan are sharing with us, I invite you to please turn on your cameras so we can be present with each other in this way. Our hope as well is that beyond this convergence, we're able to turn this conversation into action um, and into different forms of showing up for each other um, as we face uh, the largest crisis that humanity has ever faced. And I, I want to share, if we go back to the origins of the word converge and conversation, we are reminded that converging and conversing are more than just about talking or chatting with each other. Um, in Latin, conversation or conversationem also means an act of living together. So um, this, was, this was quite something to me when I looked this up, that conversation isn't just about talking and telling stories. It's an act of living together. Um, so that's, that's what this convergence is. It's an invitation to us to think on how we can live together on this planet. Um, before we go on, I want to acknowledge just the immense wealth of experience, knowledge, and skills that are in the Zoom room with us tonight. We're joined by molecular biologists, campaigners, activists, writers, poets, storytellers, filmmakers, photographers, um, farmers, uh, food activists, fermentation enthusiasts. This is an amazing gathering of people and we're so thrilled that you're all here with us. So thank you so much. And um, we're all eager to hear from Tom and Yuvan. So I will stop here and just briefly introduce them. I think you'll learn more about them from listening to them tonight than from my saying anything about the great work they've done and um, their advocacies and so on. 
but I will say briefly that um, Tom is someone who was born in Shanxi, which is um, has great ancient history of Chinese culture in that province, but is also known as the province that is the foremost producer of coal uh, in China. And so Tom witnessed these transformations first time, uh, firsthand. Sorry. And before he came to the Philippines, Tom, you were living in Beijing, and many of us have seen from photos um, in the news and on TV what the sky in Beijing looks like, or rather what it doesn't look like, because I think you didn't get to see the sky very often, not Tom? Uh, I did. I just didn't see it clearly. Right. And so Tom has this wonderful practice of posting a photo of the Manila skies every day. And it's just amazing how beautiful it looks um, from Tom's perspective. And, you know, those of us who've become kind of jaded about living in the big bad city or Metro Manila, we never look at the sky because this is, you know, <laughs> We, we, we just accept that it's polluted, it's awful, it's hot. But Tom, through his practice, has showed us a very different perspective of Manila Sky. And he's going to show us so many other perspectives tonight as well. And then, of course, there's Yuvan, um, who is in Chennai, who's joining us from Chennai. Hi, Yuvan. Thank you so much for this. And um, Yuvan is a poet, he plays music, he's an educator, a teacher of young children, and he really works to include environmental education and to get kids connected to nature. Very, very active with um, conservation issues in Chennai and beyond. And it's just thought Yuvan is a teacher in so many ways and I think that's also because Yuvan you much of your education happened outside of the classroom so you're always teaching not only when you're in the classroom and we're really happy to have both of you with us tonight I'll add also that both Tom and Yuvan are contributors to our forthcoming book Harvest Moon, Poems and Stories from the Edge of the Climate Crisis, which will be coming out later this year. So I'll stop there. And I just realized we didn't actually decide on who was going to go first. So I'll let the two of you decide on that <laughs> with each other. Hey, Tom, you go first. <laughs> All right, I, I don't mind. I can always go first because usually the most valuable uh, voices come second. So I will open up for you. Um, before I go on to my um, sharing tonight, I just uh, want to uh, apologize for wearing this mask. Not really because um, it's a mask, but just because I had a bike accident yesterday. So uh, I kind of injured my upper lip a little bit. So I don't want to give you nightmares, but also it's Pride Month. So here's the really beautiful rainbow uh, mask I got from my friends in Taiwan. Uh, so yeah, as Padma introduced, I'm from uh, Shenxi, China. Uh, Shenxi is um, right in the middle of uh, Inner Mongolia, where the desert the Gobi Desert is, and then um, uh, the south of uh, Shenxi province is the Yellow River, and to the west is the Yellow River. So Shenxi is sitting right in the cradle of the Yellow River, and the Yellow River in China is called uh, the Mother River. So that's where a lot of the Chinese agriculture, a lot of the Chinese language, the writing system, and the pronunciation started, and that's why uh, people are very surprised when they found out that my first language, my mother tongue, uh, wasn't standard Chinese. I only started to speak Mandarin or standard Chinese when I was about uh, 16 or 17 years old. And I was still uh, being laughed at when I moved to Beijing 
uh, later on in my 20s uh, for my pronunciation. People just could tell uh, I wasn't a very good standard Chinese speaker. And now I think I can uh, speak all three languages quite well. I'm really proud of my hometown, although nowadays people associate uh, my hometown with coal pollution. However, my hometown is so much richer than coal. And I think um, um, it's not just the language that it's also the food because that's where the agriculture started. And it's also alcohol. We have some of the best alcohol. It's also vinegar. People joke that, um, well, Chinese people joke that people from my hometown or Shenxi province have very nice skin. Sure, I mean, I had a bike accident, but still we have nice skin because we have very nice uh, vinegar. So everybody grows up drinking vinegar. We literally drink vinegar. So anyway, <laughs> that's my hometown. And I'm really, really proud of it. And my sharing tonight of a poem starts from my hometown. And it starts with my mom. Uh, tonight, the theme is called Corals and Willows. And Willow is my mom's surname. So I will start with um, a picture of Willows. I hope you can see it. I'm not sure how many people, because it seems a lot of our audience um, is from uh, the Philippines, and there are some from India. And in the background, you can see that's the willow tree. Uh, this is uh, quite clearly an early spring willow tree because uh, it's not very green yet uh, and some of the branches are not completely fully, um, you know, like uh, covered with leaves. And in the uh, bottom left corner, you can see the Chinese character for willow. And that's my mom's surname. And that's why that was also the first character, the first Chinese character I ever learned. She would take me to the riverside and show me the willow trees and then say, this is my surname, this is my name. And she would write that character for me. And the character is, uh, you can uh, see, has two parts. The left part means wood or tree, because it's a tree. <laughs> and then the right side is the sound. So altogether, my mom's surname is Liu. That's Willow, Liu. And willow trees are a native species, native tree to China. My hometown is very dry. As I said, it's right between the Yellow River and the Gobi Desert and in mountains. Um, so the most common trees are pine trees or cypress, those uh, evergreens. You know, they, they just basically don't need a lot of water. I mean, we don't, we don't get a lot of water. The first time I ever um, tried to eat fish, I was already 17 years old because we don't have rivers around. We don't have lakes around, but we do have some uh, small streams. And willow trees are one of the rare species they can just grow anywhere. If there is no water, they grow there. If there is water, they grow there, but just a different subspecies. Uh, the kind of uh, that like uh, water is mostly called weeping willow. I'm not sure whether um, you have heard that name, weeping willow, because the branches are very, very hangy. And uh, for example, the ones you see in this picture, they just look quite um, heavy, <laughs> but light at the same time. So I will start with a poem um, from. Uh, Tang Dynasty, which is uh, more than 1500 years ago. And usually Chinese poems are, I call them verbal pictures or verbal paintings. Again, that's what I grew up with because when I was very young, I liked doing paintings. I would go to the, uh, you know, like a little brick and then draw pictures where my mom would show me that's her surname. So the first poem, is called Yong Liu, uh, a song about willow trees, or just about willow trees, uh, by He Zhizhang from Tang Dynasty. 
I will read it in Chinese first so that you can hear the rhythm. As you can see, the shape, uh, each line is made of, of um, seven syllables. So Chinese poems are very, very neat. We call it, you know, they, it's, when, you, when you hear me reading it later on, you will see why it's so neat because each line has exactly the same syllables. Bi yu zhuang cheng di shu gao, wan tiao chui xia liu si tao. Bu zhi xi ye shui cai chu, er yue chun feng zi jian dao. So that's the whole poem, very short. And I uh, did a quick translation yesterday, uh, and I tried to make it as poetic as possible. Um, so, by the lake she stands, dressed in jade. Into the water she bends, dips those long braids. Her laces, the leaves, thin, light, and delicate, must have been tailored with spring wind's scissors blades. That's because willow trees are the first ones to wake up to any kind of temperature rise or to moist in the air. So as soon as you see those baby leaves or, you know, like, um, we call it the goose yellow green. <laughs> that color is like a baby goose. So if, when you see willow trees turn that color, you know spring is coming, although you, it still feels cold. But that's why it's the early spring winds. They, they still feel very cold, but they are already waking up the willow trees and making a dress for the willow tree. So in this poem, uh, again, as I was saying, Chinese poems, especially from ancient uh, China, mostly were verbal paintings or pictures. And this is like one of those. And the willow tree here clearly um, in this poem is compared as a lady standing by the lake, looking at herself and washing her hair. So the next poem I'm going to share is from even earlier on. Uh, it's called Shi Jin, the first collection of poems in China. That's from uh, about, I think, uh, about 3000 years ago. Um, yeah, in 1000 BC. So yeah, literally 3000 years ago. And this is only the last section of uh, this poem. It was a song about um, a soldier who left his hometown. And then this song is uh, what he was singing on his way back to the hometown. Um, so again, it goes like, Qi wo wang yi, yang liu yi, jing wo lai si, yu xue fei fei, xing dao chi chi, zai ke zai ji, wo xin sheng bei, mo zhi wo ai. You can see um, a picture of a soldier on the way back after being in a battle for many years. So what he was saying is, then when I was leaving, so lush was the willow. Clearly it was springtime, right? And now I hear in snow, not a soul of hero. So I'm returning. It has already been so many years, not just the change of the season. The journey back so long, we march on, hungry and weary. My steps dreary, yet even heavier shall be my sorrow. So these two poems, I just love them because I grew up with this kind of verbal paintings, verbal pictures, and I was sitting in that nature. And I felt such a close connection, such a connection with the tree, with 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 the songs, with the kind of emotions in these poems, and of course that was my mom. Uh, so that's that's what I want to share. You know, like it's just all the natural elements that I grew up with. Um, so that's why you know my hometown for me is more than cold, and I think uh, the history goes so far way back. And the future definitely has to be beyond cold.
and that's what I'm working on. I hope that you enjoyed these two poems, and I uh, I will share later on a bit more about, for example, uh, my mom's story or even willow trees, you know, um, and the moon. There is actually one poem about willow trees and the moon. Uh, I didn't write it down here, but everybody knows it. It's, uh, it goes, uh, so the first line is when the moon rises up to the top of the willow tree, people date after the sunset. So it's a romantic poem. <laughs> people, young people go out and date right after the sunset and while the moon is getting up to, to the top of the willow tree. So, you know, there are just a lot, a lot of poems about willow trees, about peaches, about ducks, about deserts, about the moon. And I hope you guys can get some kind of interest from this sharing and go and find some more ancient Chinese poems and we can all appreciate them. Thank you. So Tom, do you want to proceed with your talk? Ah, um, <laughs> or would you like to hear Yuvan's poem? Yeah, I think, you know, probably we can hear Yuvan's poems and then we can, uh, yeah, okay, see Yuvan's. where that goes. Yuvan, please. Uh, yeah, so hey, good evening, everybody. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, whatever it is where you are. Um, just to firstly say that I'm extremely happy to be in this group. Uh, the kind of people and uh, energies Agam brings together is a, is a special one. Uh, and I'm happy to be part of the second convergence. Um, I want to start with a poem. Uh, and could somebody give me permission, please? Oh, I have. Okay. Um, and and I, I want to show some pictures uh while i read it uh the poem is about bark um bark tree bark you know when you look at it from a distance it seems like a barren uh you know rugged vertical landscape but then when you move close to it things start moving its pieces start shifting and it acquires uh an aliveness which is created by keen observation so uh, um, let me share my screen. Sorry, sorry. So, bark, yeah. Bark, you call me. I'm a biome by myself, a stretch of sheer curvature, a tree's signature, the meaning of texture. Abode of a vast creature community, lichen tattooed, moss draped, fringed by ferns, singed by fungi. I am life whether I stand or lie, pressed on earth or bridge to sky. Home to bark gecko, bark mantis, bark beetles, bark others who wear my looks and garb my features. I'm a basking spot for snakes and lizards, grooming post for elephants and leopards, nesting place of wasp, shieldbug and spider, snack bar of barbet, natach and woodpecker, ladder and staircase for vine and creeper, morning hideout for many a midnight creature, a squirrel playground and catered with podium, civet haunts and cicada stadium, rough to flowers softness, dark to canopies brightness, grain to buds tenderness, contortion to leaves evenness, a gallery of hiddenness, Above, around, within's, without, I ooze, I flake, I crackle, I make. Kneel near me. Press your palm and cheek to tree skin. Know what it means to be bark. Full of shapes and faces and unrevealed places. Run your fingers along my interstice scape. Shade over my jigsaw maze. Peer into my cracks, peel into my gaps, submerge in barkness. What stories do you read? 
what secrets do i reveal so and these are creatures largely have taken from uh, you know found in uh, the surroundings where i live in some of them not not very close to where i live but uh, just to start off with the with the maxim that barrenness is a state of mind not not a state of land but a state of life so um so i'm going to jump into my uh talk and uh and kind of quickly quickly um go through some of the ideas i want to share a large part of the work i do involves reimagining education uh thinking about the role of schools the role of learning and learning institutions of teachers and children and 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 the interaction space um so i i really want to share three um i i want to share some of the questions uh, and values uh, i've been pursuing through the wisdom or, or through the windows of three indigenous philosophies um because uh indigenous philosophies have found a way of living um which is in deep meaning and reciprocity with the land they are part of and and they often in counter stream and in in uh interesting counterpoint to some of the beliefs and values we hold as um you know what we uncomfortably call you know urban society or you know urban living yeah so yeah uh, let me jump into it um first philosophy aki numage um and i hope i'm pronouncing that right anybody from uh you know who knows uh, who's from canada or uh, america might know how to get the right pronunciation it's from the nishnabe community uh, a, a native american community aki means earth or wilderness or nature and numage is to seek wisdom from or seek direction from uh, and and so the, so the word put together means um that the the culture that had the philosophy of let's say they were in in a conflict or there was a there was a problem in the community it was common practice to go and contemplate in wilderness and and allow it to seed a direction in one's consciousness um and as as a practice as a common practice and so here i've put these two pictures for a reason uh what you see on the right are these uh creatures called zoanthids and then on the left there is a uh you know picture i took while diving in the uh, andaman uh, coral reefs uh i had perhaps an akinumage moment in uh when i was walking on the tide pools of goa a very uh, the smallest state in india it's a coastal city on the western coast of india and then it has these huge basalt outcrops uh and and then these bucket sized tide pools where the uh, water comes in uh sea water stays in those tide pools and and then when it goes back and then you find that there is an extraordinary intertidal life which you then walk amidst and zoanthids are these creatures like corals um which open and close uh with the tide coming in and going out and then they can breathe light they can catch plankton and other cre creatures and eat them uh what you see are these mats of eyes but then that entire uh carpet is actually one single organism um and what as what is common about uh, zoanthids about corals is that back in in deep time they formed through a friendship between two organisms polyps you know little jellyfish like creatures and uh, a plankton like microscopic creatures called zooxanthellae and what these zooxanthellae do is they go into the cell and uh, they allow for photosynthesis while the polyp creates a structure Uh, and a body and and you no know, feeding parts and then a physiology and so on um you know walking amidst them and then kind of thinking about all this uh the the, the coral society kind of spoke back in a sense you know if, if one could talk about it that way you know the most 
diverse places in the world you know the the systems which host the most breathtaking diversity in you know all of earth are coral systems you know coral reefs you know systems like uh, you know zoanthid beds and they are diversity is built upon the foundation of mutual well being upon the architecture of friendship and 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 that that seemed to uh, set me off thinking uh, especially around in context with our educational systems for instance um you know classrooms often or schools often are mass production units um what would it mean or, or how would we change our values if we were to consider diversity as an important thing in 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 education in society and so on diversity in capacity diversity in selfhood in in uh, ethnicity religion um you know uh, ecological truth here you know akinumage drawing wisdom is that the most resilient the most healthy and stable ecosystems are the most diverse ones diversity is is symptomatic of ecological health and while uh, uh, habitats which lack diversity are prone to breakdown so would that be true of human society as well for instance we are gathered here from you know across the world with you know different ideas and world views and beliefs uh, is would that be a strength we we embrace or would that be a shortcoming um one of the things uh, schools don't manage well or, or treat as a shortcoming is diversity so one could call it a kind of an academic caste hierarchy it creates a certain certain capacities are treated as elite as important and then other kinds of capacities you know whether it be uh, kinesthetic or whether it be artistic other kinds of capacities are, are treated as perhaps inferior certain kinds of knowledge and knowledge systems are treated above the others um and th- that is akin to what a lot of people call the industrial model of education so let if you think about what are the values a factory lives by you know which takes raw material creates a product out of it the product needs to be of a, a size and specifications it decides uh, other others are rejects and then produces it into the system what would be the values so i'm i'm calling that system centricity you know a a, a a unit which is system centric yeah and if we were to reimagine our schools of uh, being kinder uh, and 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 being more humane we would imagine more diverse spaces and so that's a question how do we imagine how do we create more uh, diverse learning spaces how do we create a coral classroom as it were uh, and if we were to create what uh, what would be our values values are important so if the child's well being if the community's well being if the earth's well being is the center of of my value system not the system you know not the larger uh, abstraction of economic growth or whatever else then i would think of an approach learning in an entirely different way i just want to give you a quick example in the work i do we run something uh, called the earth curriculum in our school and our, our content is vast our pedagogies are different but then we are very clear about our values and we call this the value wheel so right at the center is earth child and community and then there are different spokes under each of them um there could be more but then this kind of guides us in our lesson planning in our conversations in our interactions with each other and the children uh, and and in the way we imagine forward yeah so diversity and values second philosophy um it's aini and what aini means is reciprocity or, or mutual well-being now words for reciprocity and mutual well being are, are a, a lot uh, across the world if if, if uh, any of you know it in in perhaps you know uh, philippines or china or other languages in india um uh, please put it in the chat box i uh, would uh, love to see that um in in 
a few more words for reciprocity for instance in maori uh, the word for that is kai tia ki tanga or in uh, the inuit language it's called pilimik sarnik i'm surely pronouncing it incorrectly but then um, the point here is that indigenous philosophies don't have a word for sustainability and we look at why they have a word for mutual well-being of reciprocity you know in in uh, in africa it's ubuntu you are therefore i am in in the adivasi philosophies of india the the philosophies of lokayata and charvaka they spoke about mutual well-being in in those philosophies the sacrality was not an abstraction was not in the salvation after life or or in in in, in something beyond earth but in the air in the soil in the trees in the physical material sensuous world sacrality was a daily lived experience um and and interestingly uh, you know right now i mean all all religions of the world have beautiful things about them but in in hegemonic traditions for instance uh, the majority in religion in uh, india uh, had ways of portraying this philosophy there, there were periods in history where the uh, the indigenous and adivasi philosophies was in conflict with the dom- uh, you know dominant philosophy and if you read the epics you know ramayana mahabharata what what i mean there's some beautiful meaning and and uh, history in them but then who they call demons who they call rakshasas are indigenous people in fact uh, if if you read the mahabharata there's a place in in the shanti parva uh, where Uh, it's a chapter the they say that uh, the charvaka rakshasa comes to meet yudhishthira the one of the uh, you know protagonists of the, uh, so so the charvaka philosophy actually talks about uh, a different kind of living with the world but then how we portray how our social constructs can bias us um is is something uh, we need to think about and we'll look at a little bit later i'll i'll share quickly two three stories um one is uh, just to understand mutual well-being a little bit more um one is by the linguist daniel everett was working with the piraha people in south america and he would go with them when they hunt and then these people had this uncanny oversharing tendency they the, they would hunt a deer and then they would bring it home and then they would make sure every single person within the tribe and even other communities is fed and then once he asks the chief daniel everett asks the chief why don't you store it you know why don't you store the meat and feed your family for the next several days and then the chief says i store my meat in my brother's belly i store my meat in my brother's belly um here here's another story which which can perplex a uh, uh, a kind of a western conceptualized mind you know the laps people in norway Uh, and this is a story arnes speaks about in the ecology of wisdom um they went to a dam which is being built on the river they were dependent on and then they started breaking it down and you know partially destroyed it and they were arrested and then produced in court and then the judge was asking them what are you guys doing and it took a very long time for the people there to understand what they were saying because they were saying they were coming and hurting us they were injuring us nobody injured them but for them the river was an embodied philosophical spiritual ex- uh, you know extension of their bodies you know so a world post sustainability would mean so sustainability as the world bank define it means it can do the same thing but then do it slowly you know you know let it last a little bit more till we you know uh, things vanish in that world view and it's very important to read for instance this extraordinary paper is green growth possible by jason hickel and george scales especially people who are part of the climate movement they talk about how sustainability is political fiction sustainable growth green growth they give all the empirical research for that and talk about in the backdrop of this thing called economic growth human well-being i mean intersectional human well being and ecological well being is not possible none of the research show that shows that so 
I think beyond sustainability, what are uh, perhaps one of our values should be is mutual well-being. Because in mutual well-being, in in these cosmologies, it is living such that I live so that you live well as well as I live well. Mm. Um, and to kind of connect that to education, um, schooling. You know, we underestimate how much. education systems contribute to our social and ecological crisis especially because i think it's in a it's in a spot behind us but it's important because our formative selves are are within that period you know our, our belief systems our um practices our values form during that time and what a lot of most schools do conventional schools do is is create this construct of individualism you know sometimes it's called absolute individualism now what that means is i am alone and i have to fend for myself so some of the ways in which that happens the systemically is one of the primary motivating factors is reward and punishment competition uh, rivalry one upmanship exams i got more marks than you and that promotes individualism and there's this beautiful paper which was published last year by this educational researcher called Iveta Silova she talks about how educational individualism um creates a lot of the climate crisis we face today and she looks at places which are individualistic cultures and such places are far more have more social divisions and environmental impacts while collectivistic cultures where one's self would extends beyond one self you know schools uh the underlying philosophy is to work together is that we help each other we collaborate as community if that, that is the primary value they have lesser social divisions more kindness and um uh, environmental impacts so this is something we are doing uh, i think some of my friends who are part of this i hear in this meeting uh, happy to see their names um it's a project on inaturalist the citizen science portal the idea is every child in chennai if if they spot a living organism an ant an insect a tree a fungi they should be able to know the name because a name is the window to a relationship very difficult to love something which you cannot name so so this project we've documented about 2600 species of, of all kinds of things plants snakes butterflies moths uh, fish and so on and 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 it's growing and 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 it's growing powerfully children contribute to it adults contribute to it it's an open platform and the idea is that as as a community we grow connections with the rest of nature and and a project like this helps vastly so third third and last uh, philosophy aco um which means reciprocal learning in the maori tradition interestingly in maori aco means teaching aco also means learning it's synonymous so teaching isn't without learning um in the last one year one of the most important practices i have um um kind of adapt, uh, adopted as a teacher is that when i go into a, a classroom space whether it be virtual or something else is that i just don't have learning objectives for my for the children but then i have two to three clear learning objectives for myself so i'm I, which helps me look which helps me observe so i'm i'm let's say i'm doing a module i'm introducing something and i want to watch and and I, i want to learn from each interaction you know the, the great educators of the world who who spread uh you know humane and and uh, you know ecologically sane education the you know, krishnamurthy and the richard louv and montessori and pestalozzi if a commonality you see between them is they were profound students to their children they watched they watched breathlessly you know the zen pro the teacher learns the most do our systems allow for that um in a sense what the aco philosophy does is our the metaphor we use for our uh, learning 
learning patterns and uh, learning systems is a ladder, is a hierarchy. What ACO does is it turns that ladder into a landscape, into a field. So we are all on the same platform. You know, Krishnamurti, uh, the philosopher, he's famous for telling the teacher, hey, get off the pedestal, uh, you know. And I see that not just as uh, telling a teacher to, you know, not have authority. The thing is, when your feet are on the ground, you grow wise, you learn and evolve day by day. And when you're on a pedestal, it's a less wise uh, place to be. Padma, can you tell me about time? It's time. <laughs> it's time. Okay. Okay. So, um, yeah, uh, maybe I'll end there for now and um, take, take it up later for discussion. So, uh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much, Yuva. Yeah. And I'm sure people are waiting to hear more from you. And I hope you all have written down your questions if you have them. So, um, we'll have time uh, after we hear from Tom to chat with them and ask them questions and share our stories. So thank you, Yuvan, and over to you, Tom. Thank you, Yuvan. Thank you, Padma. Uh, yeah, I, it was very inspiring there, um, especially when uh, Yuvan was showing all the pictures of the trees and the bark and, and the animals, the, all the different organs. Uh, on the park. And I just uh, got reminded again because um, of willow. Uh, actually, the bark of a willow tree has always been used as medicine in China. And in my hometown, again, uh, when a willow tree um, uh, gets cut down, we actually turn the tree trunk into chopping boards. That's what we do, you know, like the chopping board, the willow trees are. The wood is so tough and strong, it can really uh, stand up to a lot of chopping. Um, my key point tonight, I, I mean, when I was reading those two poems, one was from um, more than, um, well, about 2000 years ago. The other one was from 3000 years ago. And I always think, you know, how I learned that kind of wisdom, how I could see the verbal pictures people painted with their words 3,000 years ago. And what kind of verbal pictures of nature that we will leave and for future generations in 3,000 years in time, that will be 5,000, right? 5,000 in 2021. <laughs> Let's just imagine someone probably listening to our talk tonight. And I think that will be very, very interesting to just imagine. And do they have any kind of connection to the corals at that time? Do they have the same kind of connection that I have with willow trees? Do they have the same opportunity? to turn a willow tree into medicine, into a chopping board? Do they have the same kind of treatment that now China is using uh, willow trees to stop the desert? So that's my key point. I just think we have that responsibility to um, keep this wisdom, to pick up our ancestors' wisdom, grow that wisdom as a tree, and then pass that wisdom down. Um, nowadays, um, as I was saying, willow trees are being used even in the desert to stop the expansion of desert, the Gobi Desert. And some places, willow trees are also used to stop pollution, the river pollution, because their roots go very deep into the, into the soil and they take a lot of uh, heavy metals from uh, the polluted water. So if we are smart enough to figure out that kind of, um, I mean, we are smart enough to figure out to Zoom, right? To talk to each other nowadays, we're smart enough to uh, send people to the moon, even, you know, like quite soon to, to, to Mars. 
we're certainly smart enough to figure out a way to go back um, and dig out all the wisdom and pass that down to our future generation. Um, the English word education or educate pretty much means uh, to rear, to bring people up with wisdom, with you know what we have learned from our ancestors. In Chinese, it's the same. Um, there are two words, education or educate is xiaoyu, meaning to pass down the knowledge. There is another word, which is jiao yang, meaning culture, culture for a person to be uh, well uh, behaved, uh, well mannered. So it's the same thing. We just uh, pass down this um, knowledge as if they are trees, as if they are plants. But at least the question for today's generation is, um, are we willing to do that? Sometimes um, I'm from China and now China is um, in such a hurry to become a developed country. Uh, China has the aim to be 80% uh, urbanized. That means, you know, 80% of the people will be living in cities uh, very soon. And <laughs> will those kids in the future be able to experience what I experienced with my mom, you know, sitting under a willow tree and drawing pictures of a willow tree and some water and the sunset and the moon. Are they going to get that kind of chance? I remember too also um, my grandmother, my mom's mom, in uh, the late 70s, late 1970s, early 1980s, uh, we were very poor, so my grandmother would just uh, um, open up a piece of land by the Little Creek and then grow vegetables there so that we could get food. At that time, a lot of the food in China was rationed. You know, you had to get a coupon. Each family, each, uh, each, each head count really would get a coupon for certain food. So my grandmother took us to grow our own food, like corn, like green beans and tomatoes. I remember very clearly um, how she was teaching us to um, just to loosen up the soil. And there were a lot of earthworms and we would play with the earthworms. And my grandmother taught us to respect the earthworms because they would be helping people to, you know, like get the soil really rich and also they were life. And even today, you know, like when I see here in Manila, after the rain, there will be earthworms going around, you know, like coming out of some soil. I'll pick them up and put them back into the soil so that they don't get crushed on the road. And I think that's the kind of respect and appreciation of nature that we are obliged to pass on, just as the same way that people from 3000 years ago have passed down the, that kind of beautiful verbal picture um, of that scene from 3000 years ago. I, I do think our future generation at least deserves a chance to hear those beautiful songs of nature. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dom. That was beautiful. And, and the questions that you posed, the, the provocations actually that you posed of um, will, will children in the future have the same experiences we've been fortunate to have uh, in this life that's um, so important to, to think about and to consider because I'm struck how you both spoke of um, naming something, being able to name something as a form of being able to know something as well. And I can imagine, Tom, if we say, I love how you talked about visual words or drawn words um, as a way of thinking of Chinese writing and Chinese poetry being also very visual. Um, with the calligraphy and um, 
how you know you van you've also spoken about how with rob mcfarlane about how words are disappearing from our vocabulary and how we're unable to identify what's right before us um, could each of you say a little something more about that and then um, if you have questions for one another please also um, go ahead and have this exchange between the two of you Even is in deep thoughts. <laughs> no, I just wish I could one day really uh, experience diving. I mean, I grew up in such a dry area, you know, as I was saying, we hardly had much rain, and I never even saw fish until I was in my late teenage years. And now I live in the Philippines. Um, sure, there's a swimming pool, but um, because of pandemic, I haven't really even experienced that. And certainly I haven't really seen the real sea, real beautiful oceans around the Philippines. I've seen the Manila Bay, which is quite pathetic, really. Uh, and I think it's getting worse, but I do want to, um, learn to dive and one day uh, be able to see those beautiful pictures you can share it. Tom, you already have an invitation from Chona uh, and she said you're welcome to visit the marine station in Batangas and she works in the center of marine biodiversity in Batangas um, with De La Salle University also. So you have an invitation to go with. Um... I literally have goosebumps. <laughs> Thank you so much. Oh, great. <laughs> Yuvan, you had something yeah, to I, say. I was trying to think of a word uh, in, in the Philippines. I think it's something like Bahanian. Something like that. Ha, okay. It means something about community and what, what does that mean? Uh, it's like um, community supporting each other okay, and okay. working together. Yeah. Okay. So, so that was part of my reciprocity word list. Uh, recall it. Uh, I think what words do is they can stretch the geography of our selfhood. And, and this I've found um to be true um in, in in various contexts you know when when our uh you know ourselves our selfhood our identity is a, is a socio-political cultural construct uh and you know the story of the lap i told you or or you know the idu mishmi in uh arunachal pradesh in uh, india they have a word for spirit it's called kino and the tree has a spirit, the river has a spirit, house fire has a spirit, landslide has a spirit. Nothing in their world is inanimate. If everything lives and everything speaks. Um, so the, the, their sense of identity is vast. Uh, and I think I feel a lot of our ails in a, in a, in a consciousness level is because of our shrunk sense of selfhood a starved selfhood as, as it were and i think which which increases our suffering and i think as the, the idea of our own selfhood expands and and you know uh, to include the land you know, other people of uh, various other elements um i i think this thing called life becomes you know deep uh, gains far more depth and meaning and and and, and beauty so well, i think words can do that in, in learning a word, words and names create that crossroad of perception. In knowing the name, you start seeing something which you did not know existed for so long, perhaps right around you. By no, knowing a name, you can identify a feeling and emotion which you have felt all your life, but then it, it was at the backdrop. Um, I think that's uh, that's one of the central power of of language and uh, 
good vocabulary there's also a bad kind of naming you can divide by naming and you can uh humiliate by naming but words can stretch our self would vastly um isn't that interesting i just want to jump in right there cuz i think you then i are looking at words or languages from quite a similar but different perspective for me it's like a time travel mm. you know i want to go back 3000 years and also go into the future 3000 years and that will be you know all of these generations in the expand expand of uh, 6000 years sharing the same thing sharing the same valuable verbal picture of nature and for you i think it's going beyond ourselves and seeing you know like what is out there and that's just so beautiful i am loving this would you have uh, words for you know something which means mutual well being or, or reciprocity or of friendship in chinese uh, uh be curious in to know chinese, the easiest one uh, is the same word for uh, peace actually uh on the left side is a crop and uh, which symbolizes uh, everything uh, that grows in nature right baby crops or and the other on the other side is a mouth which symbolizes people so it's nature and people coexisting and that means Uh, you and i that means you know like addition uh, that means plus but that also means harmony uh, and it also means peace so to add plus and uh, you and i and peace and harmony they are all the same character that Ooh. has you know nature and people together <laughs> wouldn't that be far more powerful to actually write you know those symbols down it's not just the idea but then yeah also I will, I will you symbolically think. draw it it's, it's it's a kind of a double emphasis yeah yeah i, mean, I, will, I can't write peace in english and then feel the peace you know it's it's the idea i have to bring you know yeah let me <laughs> actually characters yeah shall i just write it now yeah Ooh. all right uh, i will try to find okay so uh, let me Sorry this is uh, the only notebook I have now. I don't know whether you can see it clearly. Okay, yes. We uh, can see it. In my view it's probably backward. <laughs> so this side is he, that's the crop side. Right on this side it's a square that means people or a mouse. So that means to add or you and I or nature with people. So that's uh peace that harmony i will also type it in the chat box in chinese okay thank you i i'm struck by how uh people are a mouth um, <laughs> which can yeah mean, i mean like mouth is also a measure word for for people when you say how many fam- how many uh, people are there in your family uh usually the literal translation is how many mouths do you have in a family as opposed to heads in english How yeah exactly yeah yeah mouth count <laughs> yeah instead of head count <laughs> yeah at this point i want to open the floor to to questions i mean we're all here to be in conversation with each other and we've heard a lot of provocations from yuvan and Tom so I'm sure you all have burning ideas or questions that you want to share and to kick things off I'd like to invite Pilar who's our youth volunteer at Agam and Julia our intern and I think it's important that we start the question and answer with two of the youngest participants this evening so Julia and Pilar say hello Hi everyone. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon. Um I will first introduce um Pilar. 
Um, she's Agam Agenda's youth volunteer, and she's into art, music, and she does a lot of really great graphic art. You can check it out on the Agam Instagram page. Um, yeah, go ahead, Dilar. Uh, <laughs> uh, hi. Um, so uh, there was definitely a lot that we went through today um, in this particular convergence. So um, as, as both of you were talking, I was trying to come up with something that I felt like could <laughs> sort of narrow it down a bit. Um, I, I guess I guess I wanted to ask on behalf of um, people like me and Julia who are still um, going to school. Um, for me in particular, I'm still, I, I'm, I'm about to enter my senior year in high school. And uh, for Julia, who um, will be um, attending um, her first year um, in a little while. Um, and uh, I think um, it was something that Yvonne specifically brought up earlier um, when he was talking, when, um, when he was talking um, specifically about, um, I guess, something, something fundamentally, um, I guess, interestingly um, flawed about um, something like the the English education system specifically, um, and how um, it it has the certain kind of favorability aspect to it. So um, I guess um, what what I'm trying to say is, um, students have a particular um, I guess some kind of intimidation when it comes to putting themselves out there specifically for things like activism even more so with um, something um, with quite a bit of stigma around it, something like um, literature, which is something that I've seen um, amongst some of my friends. Um, so um, I guess to bring it to both Yvonne and Tom to make it a bit easier to answer is, I guess, for um, Yvonne, um, would you mind, um, I guess, maybe um, try providing some advice for maybe, um, I guess, students and their um, students um, who are trying to put themselves out there but are intimidated because of their confidence and their skill in writing. Um, and usually that's because of their grade. Um, or um, And for Tom specifically, um, when it comes to, um, I guess, some st students being intimidated to put themselves out there, um, um, what advice would you give them, um, I, I guess, in regards to um, their, um, for some students' struggles, their um, socioeconomic background, or um, uh, something that you can also share because, uh, because of your um, personal experience um, and your discussion, how um, we can also help students um, provide respectful exposure towards um, the health of our environment, I suppose. <laughs> Thanks, Bilar. You want to respond first, Tom? Uh, I can. Uh, yeah, I, I can. I mean, um, I was a college teacher um, from 1995 to 2001. Uh, one thing I used to say a lot to my students at that time was that at that time, at least uh, China's uh, average um, lifespan was 70 years, right? So at that time, I was saying, imagine if we can grow uh, to as old as 70 years, you know, old. Um, the first 20 years, we spend the first, the earliest 20 years growing up, learning about life, getting ourselves ready. And then we spend the last 20 years from 50 to 70, already retired probably, and trying to enjoy the rest of our life. That means we have about 30 years in between. Right, from 20 years old to 50 years old to actually make a change. And then out of those 30 years, we spent one third of that sleeping. 
So we have 20 years left. And then out of those 20 years, we spend some of that eating, drinking, having fun. So you pretty much only have about 10 to 15 years to live on this planet and to make a change. It was very, very depressing really to my students, but it was a wake up call for everyone. So I still think that, I mean, uh, the words, the English word life, has two translations in Chinese. We have two words for, for life. One is, you know, like the whole, how long is your life kind of life. The other one is the everyday life. So I always believe that because our life is so short, you have to make the everyday life so much fun. And the whole world only has one Tom, one, one Xiaojun Wang, and one Padma, one Yufan. And that's how unique we all are. And that's exactly, you know, like Pride Month Month now. That's what we are celebrating. It's the pride of being yourself and just to live yourself for those 10 to 15 years. So why bother with other people's opinion? Really, that's pretty much, uh, you know, what I used to say to my students. And that's what I say to myself every day now too. What I want to say is, uh, you know, I entered teaching when I was very young. I started doing uh, science workshops in uh, rural schools in Kanchipuram with children who are from very, very poor backgrounds. And uh, in you know, schools did not have enough facilities and everything. And my, my deep interest was to spark you know, that, that passion for learning and also connect their syllabus with their immediate landscape and, and kind of make it tangible and, 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 and felt and embodied. Um, there are two things I've, I've, I've learned, I've, I'm trying to kind of grossly summarize it into two, is that you know, children don't need teaching. So, you know, the first learning is if they feel empowered, they're going to go learn extraordinary things. And I've, I've worked with, so I've stopped teaching subjects for, for, you know, for many, very many years. I've been teaching, uh, you know, what we call under the earth curriculum, you know, citizenship, nature education, and so on. So I've kind of consciously said no more subject teaching, uh, which I actually started with. Um, I've worked with 16-year-olds, 15-year-olds, on, for instance, we worked on the Pulicat campaign together and, you know, they, they did a whole lot of things. They were, they were part of initiating an art storm. They reached out to 50 different schools in Chennai, got signatures from over 500 school and college going students, sent that off to the chief minister, to the collector, to the pollution control board and the public hearing for Adani. I don't know if anybody knows Adani here, big multinational company was canceled because of the kind of pressure and energy these children showed. Yeah, that's, that's the energy I think young people have. They, they, they have extraordinary agency and then they don't need teaching. They need to feel empowered. And sometimes what schools do is they break their spirit in so many ways. And, and I think that's one of the great, uh, that's a sadness uh, of, of what schooling can do. If, Forget content, forget subjects. If children can feel extraordinarily empowered, they're going to learn the stuff. i tell you one of the ways in which we, we kind of systematically disempower children. I don't know if uh, any of you have read Anders Ericsson's work, uh, Peak, you know, the 10,000 hour rule. So if you practice something for 10,000 hours, you're supposed to become world expert at it. Um, from kindergarten, to about grade 12, I don't know what you call it in uh, you know, your country, uh, you know, just before college, 11th and 12th, uh, higher secondary. Children um, practice passivity for 12,000 to 15,000 hours, which means they sit on a chair and then learn to listen, learn to be obedient, to nod your head to authority, to not ask questions. They train through that period. Now, when you go out of 
so it's 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 a physical passivity as well as a you know societal passivity uh, schools churn out passive people i mean even beyond that you know young people find the means and ways to make change but when somebody goes out when you practiced it all your life when you go out into the world when a tree is being cut or 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 a river is being dammed why would you speak out you you've never uh, you know acted on that or, or practiced that earlier or you've not prepared for that um so yeah that that's that's where i want to respond from uh, to kind of for and if, if one is aware of it one can do it for oneself to kind of completely uh learn not to uh be systematized into passivity you know and find your tricks and hacks and everything to kind of meander around it thank you you when i see julia nodding so i think she's she's going to take a page from that and when she enters university she's not going to sit passively and her teachers don't know what they have coming but you have a question julia sorry <laughs> um but when you're right you know i'm already i try my best not to be passive through life but what you one just said that really just encourage that more that's i think going to be my new motto in school um i'm going to do my best to keep my questions short um uh as padma said i'm an incoming university student i'm taking up environmental studies and with everything that um yuvan and you tom have said i'm going to be honest i'm a little overwhelmed with all the information that i've gained in this discussion <laughs> i hope i'm not the only one but what i wanted to ask is that with everything that you both have said from the skies in beijing from your hometown in china and to the coral reefs being the most biodiverse um there's so many things that the environment and climate change has taught us and it's shown that really the youth and so many other people have really moved to make a difference in terms of the environment um, changing the system so that it's revol it revolves around nature the earth but it still seems like it still seems like there's so many things that's happening but we're still moving at such a slow pace like there's still these large corporations these politicians who don't want to listen to us there's so many other large factors that we always consider when we talk about progress when we talk about development so i just want to ask how do you still keep going how do you still keep that motivation to keep pushing for what you believe in for what you strive for what you're passionate about when there's so many things that are being put in the way there are so many things that are challenging your passion challenging your work and challenging everything that you believe and that you stand for i'm sorry i sound like i'm about to cry because i am about to cry but this is a very great discussion <laughs> i yeah padma i got the short <laughs> So how do we keep going even when things can get very frustrating and um despair becomes an easy way out right which we all try to be careful of and I think Yuvan and Tom have a lot of experience but um this gathering has a lot of experience um and so anyone who wants to respond also to Julia's question and Pilar's question please do so um i think that so that's an important challenge to to all of us so tom or you van there was extraordinary energy in that uh, in that question um first thing which uh, comes to mind is one of the most powerful ways uh, i've seen and 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 perhaps you know other people have seen um is to 
engage in the mainstream you know civic action political action is far more powerful than not using a plastic bag i mean the, i think it's important not using a plastic bag and everything and and you know by buying organic vegetables and stuff uh but direct political action especially young people uh i mean in 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 say in in well researched uh peaceful well informed ways can be extremely powerful because it it puts pressure in in the right place and it's the close it's the shortcut to change or the the the, the, the um not the easiest part but but the most direct part um and then what happens is when you engage with it and when you act and you embody it those beliefs and those values and dreams get strengthened uh within within one um and and that that keeps you going um that's that's my attempt to answer the the the, the depth of that question and and other people please go ahead yeah i will give it a try <laughs> i was talking to a um a podcaster in china a few weeks ago uh, exactly about this um about uh, climate change uh, urgency and uh, young people's future well the whole human future really and the same question popped up is you know how do you stay optimistic and to be very honest um uh, it's hard but we don't have any other options i mean opt being optimistic is our only option we just have to believe that tomorrow will be better we just have to believe that 2030 will be better than 2020 any one and that that's it you know like uh for me that's what i get up every morning and really the first thing that comes to my mind is just to, you know uh, by 2030 we must have done something right to make it better than 2021 it's just as simple as that and i also think um again the same thing i said to the podcast a host to you know it was a nice tool for them to use to spread this information this is the same kind of tool we are using today right here tonight to spread the information and more importantly you julia going to college will turn yourself into that tool and start to spread that information when we become that willow seed right we will grow into a beautiful willow, willow tree and then there will be more willows around so turn yourself into that willow tree that's what i have to say thank you tom and you van julia pilar we love you it's going to be okay we're all trying <laughs> for you thank you for um for your questions both and thank you for challenging us and also reminding us why why we're all here together this evening i think we've all come together for shared reasons um and you both of you um embody those reasons for us so thank you for what you shared would anyone else like to um respond to Julia or Pilar or even ask your own question or share something Chona hi I'm so glad you're here uh, please introduce yourself and great to hear from you uh, thank you from Padua hi everyone I'm Chona I'm the coordinator of the Brother Alfred Shields Marine Station of De La Salle University and I can't help but feel a little teary eyed because of Julia's question earlier because uh, I just came from a uh, defense with the Department of Science and Technology we were renewing a 3 year project that's hoping to help the sustainability of our aquaculture here in the Philippines and 
every time we go through a defense, it almost feels like we're going through the eye of a needle and everybody's questioning the validity of what we do. And we're just asking for a small amount of money and it almost feels like we're being asked to beg so that we can help the Filipino society. So I feel you. I, I, I've asked myself this afternoon, why am I doing this? But I think one of the reasons, and I think what um, Tom and Yuvan talked about this evening, one of the reasons I think of is because as a species, I think we are in love with the concept of beauty. And we want to preserve a lot of the things that currently exist in the world that are beautiful. And that's, that's definitely not a bad thing. It's painful, but it's not a bad thing. But the thing is, if you study biology, which I do, um, whether through us or not, a lot of what's in nature will vanish, as it has done for millions and millions of years. It's just sad that in our pursuit for survival, we have destroyed so much. And it's painful to destroy something beautiful that already exists before us. And it's even sadder that not all of us feel this pain as keenly or as deeply. So a lot of environmental discussions can end up being depressing because we've dug ourselves into such deep problems. But also as an agent of science, <laughs> I would like to believe that we've also created a lot of magic, a lot of beautiful things that have lengthened our lives and have made delightful food possible. So I am an optimist that in our love for beauty, we can find a way to live gently. And though there is a certain level of urgency right now because we are at the brink of a major change, it's destroying a lot of the beauty that we see. And it's our fault. But then again, if you look at the history of Earth, we are a very, very young species. We've been here barely a blink of the world's existence. And if you consider, there was this photosynthetic species that came to be 4.6 billion years ago. The first of its kind that can create energy from the sun. And because it existed, it actually destroyed the world 4.6 billion years ago. All living things died because of this photosynthetic thing that's still alive until now, part of corals, part of willow trees. And I wonder sometimes, how would it feel if it saw the world destroyed back then, and yet it saw it remade millions of years later? So that makes me hopeful that since we too are products of nature, and therefore, hopefully what we create are also products of nature, we will find that balance. Or maybe we'll vanish and let Earth recover and create something beautiful from the chaos we left behind. So yeah, that's, that's, that's what I hope for, Julia. Thank you for this. Thank you so much, Chona, for jumping in as an agent of science and for giving us that million-year perspective. We're always talking about time and how short-sighted we are and how we're not looking far back enough into the future. Um, and now, just by what you've said, I realize we're, maybe we're also not looking far back enough. I mean, Tom, you took us 3,000 years back with poetry, and then Chana comes along and takes us how many million years uh, back? But it's just a great um, way to rethink um, our place on this planet. I. I it's, I'm aware that it's 9.30 and we invited all of you to be here from 8 to 9.30, but I see some hands raised and I feel like the conversation is just starting to warm up. So first I want to ask Tom and Yuvan, are you all right to go on and um, speak some more and share some more with our participants? Thank you. And then I want to ask our participants, are you also okay to stay on for a while longer um, to listen to each other? We ha we've, we've only heard from a few of you and we'd love to hear more. Of course, we respect your time and we understand if you have other things you need to do or other places you need to be. 
Um, thank you for joining us, though, and for, for being here. But please feel free if you need to go. There's no pressure to stay except the pressure of wanting to hear more from everybody here. So I, I see um, Clarita Mendez. Um, hi, please introduce yourself to everyone. And then after you, we'll hear from Maria as well. Hi, thank you. Um, thank you for organizing this talk, first of all, and also you and, and Tom for um, sharing those wonderful poems and everything that you all spoke about. I'm currently based, I come from India, but I'm currently based in Germany doing my master's in biological sciences. And my question goes to you one, and also I think in part to Tom. You all spoke about the fundamental importance of names and how names play a role in the kind of emotions, the kind of feelings that a person kind of goes through. Um, if you go back to the industrial revolution right through the start of it and you look at how nature and indigenous people, the tribes were being portrayed, they, these were dis, like sort of described as dark, monstrous places like you once spoke about the Ramayana which kind of follows the same trope where they were places the wild was places you just do not step into it's dangerous you do not it's the unknown uh, the people that live in tandem with it are uncivilized so during that time the sort of literature that was being put out the sort of naming that was there for nature or wildlife was quite harsh and recently quite technically recently is where we are bringing about a different sort of naming for nature, where it's no longer just a scary place. It's a place that you go to learn something. It's a place that shows you what truly life is. It's where a lot of us go to six solas. And I was wondering whether the language that these indigenous people during those olden times, the long forgotten languages that they used to describe their sort of relationship with nature, or different things like how they name every spirit, everything is named as a particular spirit. Um, what if we bring back this language that previously was kind of tabooed and you were forced to forget about it, bring back this language and then allow the new generation to learn about it and use this to form a new sort of connection with the wild and the nature. Um, how well would it work? And is it something that we, like, I feel personally, I feel it's an important thing that we should do going back to our ancestral roots, bringing up the stories and those words, but would it be possible to actually put it in an educational system and teach little children about it? Uh, Padma, for the sake of time, uh, can I share an essay which kind of speaks to the entire gamut of that question? Great. Um, sure. Will, will you drop a link in the... Yeah, I'll comments? drop a link. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Tom, would you like to respond? Or anyone else, of course. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that I'm, I'm lucky that um, Chinese is the language that has stayed uh, kind of like the same, at least the writing system. Um, we have a lot of different pronunciation, but the core of the language has pretty much stayed the same. And um, so that's why, you know, at the beginning, when I shared poems from 3000 years ago, it still makes sense. You know, today, people today are reading the same poem uh, in, in, in quite similar writing as they did uh, 3000 years ago. So sure that's a clear example then that it's possible and it should be made possible and i do like that approach and it is happening in china it has been happening in china all the time thank you tom if if i may share really quickly when you were speaking i um, remember that when i wrote about nature conservation and indigenous people's rights I really wanted to move away from speaking of natural resources, but even within a conservation context, it was so hard to, to say something else 
um, you know, like to speak of what everybody speaks of as natural resources as something much, much more um, than that. And um, of course, the indigenous peoples that I spoke with s would speak of nature not just as a place, but um, as a source of life or where we work. Um, but it was also when we work and how we work, right, that they spoke of um, the environment. And just in writing, I failed totally to do away with the word resources, I confess. And I think that's part of the ongoing work um, that you brought up. And it's really a challenge for all of us to move away to that ex from that extractive um, language. So thank you for that question, Clarita. And I'm going to go now to Maria. Maria. Please introduce yourself to everyone. We can't hear you, Maria. But you're not on mute. Um, but we can't hear you. Uh, it might be something in your settings. While, while you try and sort that out, I'm going to go to the next person and then come back to you just in the interest of time. Hear me now? Oh, yes, we can. Yeah, Wait. okay. <laughs> there we go. I'm alive. Um, you might also hear my bird companions in the background, so they're part of this too. Um, thank you so much, everyone. This is the perfect start to my day. I'm diametrically opposed on the other side of the globe right now. Um, I'm Maria. I'm based right now in Curacao, which is my birth island. It's in the Caribbean, just off the coast of Venezuela. And hearing you both speak, Yuvan and Tom, and the contributions thereafter has been so enriching because um, I just want to share really briefly that I'm returning to my home island after 12 years. And in a way, it has been uh, a reconnection um, of reestablishing a relationship, a little bit of renaming as well, of, of relearning the names um, of birds, of, of everything around me. And um, going back to something that Yuvan said around barrenness um, not being a state of land, but a state of mind, um, resonates a lot being here because this island was actually named Useless Island by the first colonizers. It is an island that is semi-desertic, semi it's arid, technically 3% only is fertile land. Um, and I've been really interested by this sort of construction of aridity or of barrenness or of waste. Um, and, and being here has been such a lesson to cultivate the gaze and observation and the ability to observe and appreciate even the minuscule reflections of life, you know, popping through the arid land. Um, so, so in a way, I want to go back to, to, to the question, and I think um, uh, Clarita before me also spoke to this, of reestablishing relationships and education around, or relational education, because we are, I think, plagued by relational illiteracy. Um, we don't really know how to sustain relationships. We're not taught to do that either. So, and all the, the indigenous philosophies that you shared, Yuvan, speak to this, to relationships, to mutual well-being, reciprocity, taking guidance from willows and corals. Um, it's about nurturing these better relationships. So I wanted to ask all of you, uh, how can we tackle this relational illiteracy with ourselves, with families, with people we love, but also with our environments about um, how can we essentially, yeah, turn this all into a relational education. <laughs> and I think it speaks a little bit to the previous question around stories and how we can in include ancestral wisdom also into, into our education system. So thank you. Any thoughts? Anyone? <laughs> okay, well, I guess that my more was. But I had my hand up. I just want to very quickly um, share some, some thoughts. Um, 
at the very beginning, I think when Padma was uh, introducing people, uh, there were ecologists, there were writers, there were filmmakers, there were teachers, there were poets. Um, you know, I I see those as labels. Those are just name tags. So the very first thing we do is to shake off those labels. I am none of those. I, I, I really literally don't really think I belong to any of that because I don't have a scientific background. I haven't really tried any of those things. But also, I mean, just now when people were talking about biodiversity and stuff, the thing is, even in my hometown or even in the Gobi Desert, there is very, very rich biodiversity too. It's just that things are very different there. It's not the ocean, it's not the corals, it's probably you know, hardly any willow too. But in the desert, it has its own biodiversity, it has its own nature, you know, like system there. But it's just beyond our imagination because we haven't experienced it. So I really encourage everyone to first of all shake off all those labels that others or we ourselves have put on our own heads so that we can move forward, so that we can really talk to others and put ourselves into their shoes and see things from their perspective. Quick thought on um, relational education. Um, you know, uh, perhaps just tackling one fragment of all that it could mean. Now, I work with fisher folk a lot, uh, especially re recently um, through campaigns and through documenting the coast, a coast being uh, perhaps the most vulnerable to uh, climate change. And also it's, it's a margin, uh, as in it's in the frontier of all the, uh, you know, disasters and everything. And societally, it's at the margins, you know, the fisher folk and the coastal folk are marginalized in that sense. So, so that's, that's an area of interest for me. Um, when a child is three years old, five years old, he or she goes on the boat into the ocean. You know, ocean is the teacher, the sky is the teacher. You know, recently, some very interesting wisdom we got and you know, through walking with, they can, they can tell a storm uh, if it's coming, even before the clouds showed by standing in the intertidal and if your feet sink into the sand, means the storm is coming and then I had to go read up all kinds of things to understand why I believe the longshore currents velocity increases so you know the, the, the sediment velocity increases so it goes down whatever the, that guy knew that I, I don't even know if I'd be able to kind of perceive that and, and make the correlation so I went and stood there um, now I've been with uh, a tribe called uh, Kartanayakan uh, they live in uh, a place called the Nilgiris in Western Ghats in India these children, you know, they go out in the forest very early and they can look at honeybees. And so basically they're traditional for th hundreds of years, they're honey gatherers. They look at honeybees and they say, wait, wait, let's not go. This, uh, you know, it's not filled itself with pollen yet. It's going to visit, you know, flowers and they can read honeybees. They can understand its language. I, th I think an important part of relational education is, and so here we are in conventional schools sitting utterly divorced from the real world, you know, in these, in these cinder blocks called classrooms. Um, and you look at communities who have lived here wisely for a long time. Very, very early, from infancy, the child learns directly from the subject matter, you know, whether, whether it's the land or the, the ocean or the, or whatever it be. Yeah. So, you know, the question is how, how do we kind of take away that that artificial distinction of, of you know learning separate from doing you know learning separate from actual engagement and participation with the matters of environment society D direct relationship you know if you know that there's learning which you do somewhere else and then there's doing and there's action which happens somewhere else um 
yeah, that, that's my response. Would anyone else like to jump in? Okay, I'm going to call on Abby. Hi, Abby. Glad you're here. Please introduce Hello. yourself to everyone. Hi, I'm Abby. I'm in Jakarta. Good, good to see you again, Patma. Hi, Tom. Hi, everyone. I see Red here. I don't know who else do I know. Golda, of course. Um, okay, I, I won't be. I won't be long. Uh, I, I'm, as I said, I, I'm glad this is about education. So um, we learn. We learn to adapt. We learn to survive. Uh, so I'll just leave uh, this saying from our um, father of education. This uh, our father is, of education is Ki Hajar Dewantara. He's um, uh, before Indonesia, uh, um, the Indonesian independence. So he uh, b uh, uh, founded this first school for indigenous people in 1922. And uh, what's, what I want to share with you is his motto for this school which is, um, it sounds very simple, but if you listen to it again, it's very interesting. It's Ingar So Sung Tulodo, uh, the one in front leads, Ing Madyo Mangun Karso, the one uh, in the middle raised the spirit, and Tutburi Handayani, which is the one in behind supports. And the, the last part is now the uh, used by the Ministry of Education, but anyway, uh, we see uh, everyone um, learning and teaching is divided into roles. So everyone has a role to teach. You can teach from everywhere, from your friends, from your elders, from the young people, from everywhere. So I'm glad this is about education. And uh, I love your talk, Tom, Yuvan. Thank you very much. And uh, everyone, Padma, for arranging this. And uh, the um, the young generation also. Good luck and um, keep up the spirit. And um, yeah, learn. <laughs> Thank you. That's it. Thank you, Abby. Could I ask you to quickly drop the name of the father of education so those of us that may want to learn more okay. can look him up. Thank you. Great. Um, and while we have Abby here in Jakarta, Yuvan in um, India, and um, we have friends in, well, Maria in Curacao, um, I just want to put out this question. Would any of you be interested in organizing another one like this, another convergence, but maybe more centered um, in India or if possible in China or in um, Indonesia um, so just let me know and we'll we'll work on it we'll get back to you and we can work on it together to to make another convergence happen um, based in your own communities as well so please let us know anything anything more um, any more questions or stories or insights to share? Yes, Terence. Please um, um, introduce yourself. Uh, hello, everyone. I, I'm, I, I'm Terence Pineda, and I'm I think I'm I'm in the young generation, and I would like I would just like to share my thoughts and thoughts. Um, uh, a while ago, um. Mr. Yu Yuan was uh, was um, telling about uh, the rational learning uh, and about being direct or people uh, people learning directly, experiencing things um, more uh, up close rather, rather than uh, sitting on a chair or sitting on a chair just listening. Um, I guess um, what I can what, what I what, what I was thinking about is that uh, during this situation like the pandemic and everything. Um, uh, uh, the direct learning has have become uh, a more challenging way, or a more a more difficult way, or a more it's it's now it's in, in our street it's a bit more it's it's hard to do. So I get uh, I just 
would like to uh it's uh as for us like you now who would like to to do change or to to influence others uh uh, we we're, we're now in a situation like um we're um we've been pushed to work harder or to think more innovative or more better to to do things and then uh, I guess that that's my thought about it and uh, at least in what we're doing with this talk and everything and everything every small impact that we do like it can be collected like as a whole to have a, a huge impact uh, even like a small and then. It, collectively it makes a huge impact to the world and to anyone or to that we can influence that's all thank you thank you terence you're absolutely right um and that's that's why we do this also in the hope that the effect will be cumulative and and over time this will make a difference for someone or something beyond this immediate circle. Nash, you want to share something? Hi, Padma. Hi, everyone. My name is Nash and I'm calling in from Belgium. I currently live in the city and this conversation has just got me thinking about what a lot of my friends in the cities also often say. That, you know, when you're in the city, you're so separated from nature. But I was, I was thinking about what Yvonne and Tom mentioned earlier, especially about the earthworms and how Tom moved the earthworms back to the earth. And I realized that even in a city, it doesn't matter where you live, even in a city, there is some kind of nature that is trying to revolt against all this concrete. And, and I love it. So while walking around the city, I look for all these patches of cement where the green kind of comes out. And, and if you grew up in our hometown with Padma Baguio, we love it because everybody wanted to cement. There was like this cement revolution where even the tree was cemented and then they put a sign that said plant a tree. And I just love, I just love that nature finds a way to kick back and say, look, I'm here, you know, observe, notice. And I think that's also what gives me hope, the fact that nature itself is revolutionary. And maybe in terms of education and what I've been reflecting on based on what was shared today is really, I think we don't give enough attention to what the purpose of an education really is. So, in the end, I feel like we're a confused species. We don't really know what we value. And, and this is where I see um, this need for eco-literacy, relational literacy, because our education doesn't really celebrate our humanity, our being in nature, our togetherness. It, it really feels more like a means to an end. We get a degree so that we can become important, whatever that means. We get all these things attached to our names. But, but I think what's striking to me is that I know more about the names of corporations than I know about the world around me. And, and that I think as a human being, that gives me more stress than, you know, I mean, at the end of the day, I can't eat the oil that a corporation sells. I can't eat the clothes either. But nature really gives. And yeah, and I can't believe that up to now, we still don't know what the purpose of an education is. I think that's very tragic. So I hope this conversation, I'm looking forward to the next one already. I hope we have it in Indonesia and India. I follow the work of Yuvan and Tom, and it's and yeah, and I follow also young people. I, I love how they see the world. I love how they teach us. And I'm hoping for more of this. And I hope we think about that. What is the purpose really of being educated? What does it mean? And yeah. Thank you, Nash. I will um, close this session now. I'm very sad to do it, but I think um, it's time to, some of us need to hit the sack. 
<laughs> some of us have other lives to other work and other things to do um, just to what Nash said and I think to something that drew us all together tonight um, I have a story to tell about what I think eco literacy is and a few years back, I had the opportunity to visit an Agda community in the Sierra Madre. Um, so it's a, they're an indigenous community in the Sierra Madre. And there were no children um, in this particular group. And they were in Kailogan in Aurora. And um, it, it turns out that all the children were living uh, sababa, which which means down down there or downtown because that's where the school was and um, they had to live far from their families in a dorm or a boarding house so they could attend the school there was one boy one boy who just refused to go maybe it was Tom maybe it was Yuvan and he he stayed with his parents and I and I met him and he um, he said, I, I prefer to stay here because my mother's here. And then he offered to take us around and show us around. And um, he knew the names of plants. And we were asking silly questions like, uh, can this be eaten? Is this poisonous? And he had the answers to all of them. We had no idea. And then he, um, he said he was going to show us how good he was at spear fishing, so he took us to the river and he kept seeing fish and we couldn't see them, at which point I was starting to feel really ignorant. <laughs> and then he would go running down the hill and we would come tripping and sliding and screaming after him. So I think, I think he was literate and we were the ones illiterate in this context. He, he could read the plants, he could speed read paths, he could speed read his way through um, a muddy, um, sheer slide of slope and just speed read a safe path down while the rest of us clumsily followed. Um, and I think that's, in a nutshell, that's what eco literacy is. It's being able to read our landscapes and being able to read um, relationships that may not be so obvious um, to the naked eye or may not be obvious because we were taught not to pay attention to these things because they're not important. And Tom and Yuvan have showed us a great way of refocusing our attention on these relationships on corals, on willow, and on one another, and just creating that consciousness of how we learn and how we are in conversation with each other, or how we live with each other. So thank you so much, everybody, for everything that you shared, for your presence, for turning your cameras on so we can all see each other and not just be looking at one screen. And we would love to work with you to organize something like this in your communities in Indonesia or Colombia or in India as well. Perhaps uh, Yuvan, you could lead this or Tom could lead the next one. Um, Abby in Indonesia, Maria. We have so much capacity again here to create these conversations and share them with other uh, people so let's do that we'll be in touch or please reach out to us and let's let's work together